Welcome to the just barely in September 2022 open meeting of the Federal Communications Commission. Before we turn to our open meeting agenda, I just want to have a few quick words. I think all of us have our eyes on Hurricane Ian, which continues to bear down on Florida. And of course, it's only been 10 days since Hurricane Fiona left the entire island of Puerto Rico without power. Our thoughts are with those whose lives have been upended by these storms, but more than that, we have committed our resources now and for the long haul to ensure that communications recover and are rebuilt. In addition, some breaking news. In Romania, earlier today, Doreen Bogdan Martin was elected the next Center Secretary General of the International Telecommunications Union. She was voted into this position with support from 139 of the 172 ballots. That is a big margin and a big deal. She is the first woman elected to this role in the ITU's 157 year history. Now, I know a two thing or two about what that's like. Change comes slowly, but amen to it happening. And congratulations to my friend and colleague, Doreen, who I know will be a terrific leader of the ITU and a great friend to this agency. Madam Secretary, will you please introduce our agenda this morning? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Good morning to you. Good morning, commissioners. For today's meeting, you will hear four items for your consideration. First, you will consider a second report and order that would adopt rules requiring low Earth orbit space station operators planning disposal through uncontrolled atmospheric reentry to complete disposal as soon as practicable and no more than five years following the end of their mission. Second, you will consider a report and order and further notice of proposed rulemaking to improve access to communications for incarcerated people with disabilities and reduce the financial burdens created by certain calling service charges and practices. Third, you will consider a report and order to improve the clarity and accessibility of emergency alert system, or EAS, visual messages to the public, including persons who are deaf or hard of hearing, as well as others who are unable to access the audio message. Fourth, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking that would amend part 73 of the commission's rules for television and class A television broadcast stations to remove obsolete rules for analog TV operations. This is your agenda for today. The first item is titled Space Innovation, Mitigation of Orbital Debris in the New Space Age and will be presented by the International Bureau and Patrick Weber, Deputy Chief of the Bureau will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Mr. Weber, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and good morning to you and your fellow commissioners. I'm pleased to introduce the International Bureau's latest efforts to facilitate innovation and increase safety for space-based services. Today, we present for your consideration a second report and order adopting rules that require satellite operators in low Earth orbit to dispose of their satellites within five years of completing their missions thereby reducing orbital debris and the risk of costly collisions for current and future missions. I'd like to thank the team in the International Bureau for their work on this item, as well as our colleagues in the Office of Engineering and Technology, the Office of Economics and Analytics, the Office of General Counsel, the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, the Enforcement Bureau, and the Office of Communications Business Opportunities for their assistance. Seated with me this morning are Carl Kensinger, Chief of the International Bureau Satellite Division, and Sankar Persaud, an electronics engineer in the Satellite Division. Sankar will present the item. Thank you, Patrick. Good, mor good morning, Madam Chairwoman, Commissioners. Before you is a draft second report and order, which, if adopted, would shorten to five years the current 25-year benchmark for post-mission disposal applicable to space stations in low Earth orbit. Specifically, the second report and order would require that for space stations ending their mission in or passing through the low Earth orbit region below 2,000 kilometers altitude, 
disposal must be completed as soon as practicable, but no later than five years after the end of mission. Post-mission disposal is essential for the mitigation of orbital debris, and the commercial space industry has increasingly recognized the importance of not leaving defunct objects in orbit after their useful life. Reducing post-mission orbital lifetime has multiple beneficial effects, including reduction of collision risk and operational impacts on outer spacecraft. The I'll second report and order is now exiting. Sorry. The second report and order also provides a transition period of two years for implementation of the new requirement. The two-year period time for any necessary adjustments by operators to continue existing services and adjust planned operations. The second report and order also addresses the potential for waivers, including those for certain research and scientific missions. The second report and order concludes that a five-year post-mission orbital lifetime strikes an appropriate balance between meaningfully reducing risk while remaining flexible and responsive to the burgeoning commercial space industry. The International Bureau recommends adoption of the second report and order and requests editorial privileges for technical and confirming edits. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Thank you. We will now hear comments from the bench. We'll begin with Commissioner Carr. I want to start by uh, echoing the Chair's comments on the two hurricanes that we're seeing, including the one ongoing right now in Florida. Uh, I express my two cents of um, having our thoughts and prayers with all those that are still in harm's way in southwest Florida. Um, there's obviously a lot of search recovery uh, operations going on right now, and I want to also thank the chair and her team. There is an entire, obviously, cross-bureau staff uh, that she has stood up to look at this issue since before landfall. Uh, we have officials down there in Florida right now uh, helping to maintain and restore communication. So I want to thank uh, her and her, her team for the work that they're doing there. There's usually a pattern that we see with these types of storms. There's an initial outage of cell sites and other comms, uh, sometimes quickly restored, but then the next couple of days end up proceeding in a bit of a sawtooth pattern where there's recovery and then setback. Some of that is related to debris removal uh, as we restore communications and power and other lines and clear roads. Uh, you can sometimes take down inadvertently uh, telecom lines. Uh, the chair put out a notice on this uh, a day or so ago already to try to help further promote coordination in the uh, restoration efforts. Um, another issue obviously tends to be power as power is out longer. Uh, cell sites that are up and survive the storm uh, can have difficulty uh, in the days after, uh, particularly if there's uh, uh, challenges getting there to restore uh, backup power, fuel to those types of sites. So we are uh, very actively monitoring this situation. The chair has a team on this. Uh, and we're going to continue to monitor it closely uh, while, again, expressing our, uh, our, our thoughts and, um, and prayers with everyone that is down there in harm's way. Turning to this item before us now, I think that um, the future of telecom services delivered from space is more bright now than ever before. There's probably some star analogy that I could have could have fit in there, but 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 missed the window on that. At least almost did. Um, and I'm a big fan of the services that are being delivered there. I think it's part of a new competitive landscape where it used to be that you know wireline competed with wireline, mobile with mobile. Um, that's not the case anymore. Some of the biggest cable providers uh, are taking on the most new wireless subscribers, and some of the mobile wireless providers are. Um, taking significant market share, what historically you would have viewed as a cable market. Um, so it's a very exciting time, and I think this new generation of low-Earth orbit satellites uh, is part of that new competitive landscape that it's going to greatly benefit consumers. There's challenges, though. Obviously, when you have thousands and thousands of satellites up there moving at, um, uh, at, at significant <laughs> speeds, uh, orbital debris is a challenge. So I'm glad that we are moving forward with this proceeding to take a look at it. I've, I've long sort of expressed a little bit of skepticism um, about the FCC going alone here. I'm not suggesting that's what we're doing here, just historically my view is, you know, we need to make sure that we're leaning on the expertise of other agencies that do in fact have a cadre of rocket scientists uh, to help inform this, and so I hope that, that we do that here, but I think this is a great way of, of proceeding and taking comment, uh, and I look forward to the record as it develops. So it has my support, thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Carr, and I appreciate you calling out the staff's work with respect to these hurricanes. Commissioner Starks, coming to us 
all the way from Romania, where the ITU is happening. So prove to us the power of communications and uh, let us know what you think about the item before you. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Honored to be coming to you. Echo the comments uh, of you and Commissioner Carr on thoughts and prayers with, with all who are affected by the natural disasters. But I am honored to be here, as you mentioned, at a historically uh, making moment. That is the election of Madam Secretary General elect Doreen Bogdan Martin. As I know you saw as well, uh, Chairwoman, um, this truly was a team effort. Uh, to be sure. Uh, the resources marshaled here across the U.S. government uh, is truly impressive, but I have to give a special shout out uh, to those in the International Bureau in particular, uh, who, whose work has been um, uh, tremendous, tireless, uh, and, and impressive. And I also have to note that uh, rightfully so, many folks that were here this first week will go home uh, within the next few days, but it will be, in fact, our IB team that will be continuously working here for a number of weeks still on a number of the hard hitting and more weed uh, in the weed based issues that are going on here at the ITU. And so, um, as ever, thank you to Tom Sullivan, but truly also the, the countless number of IB team members that I have seen hard at work here. Uh, and thank you for that indulgence. Now, here to the item, the commission has been hard at work at promoting and adapting to the new space economy. To measure that success, we've often marveled at the new system deployment and celebrated the new capabilities that they've been able to bring to the market. But as a space regulator, our role is about more than simply just making sure the next few missions achieve liftoff. We also need to plan ahead for the missions that we know will follow. And that means making sure that at a new era of space innovation, ultimately it doesn't collapse by the weight of its own success here. And so that's the motivation behind the order that we adopt today. We know that orbital, deb orbital debris is already an issue. We know the amount of debris is largely a function of what we put up, net of what we bring down, plus of course the massive quantity of debris generated by collisions and other fragmentation events. And so if thousands of new satellites launch every year, are replenished every 5, 10, 15 years, yet we take a 25-year uh, time frame to demise once a mission is done, the rate of that debris accumulation uh, will grow rapidly and, and perhaps unsustainably so. Thankfully, most new systems in the LEO don't need 25 years for that post-mission disposal, even above the lowest operational altitudes. And so a few, uh, you know, a few operators would target that 25 years if they had to shoulder that debris related external costs on their own. And so with this order, we do take uh, that practical step of reducing the demise times in LEO uh, to no more than five years, a time frame that is, and we know is readily achievable. So compliance will be the new rule here to bend the curve of debris proliferation. The five year rule along with our ongoing debris mitigation efforts also will help us keep the promise of a new space economy marked by accessibility, entrepreneurship, and the repeat breakthroughs that we all hope for in efficiency. And so for those winning characteristics uh, that we hope will persist, we really need to manage this debris problem successfully. Uh, without a safe operating environment, debris could risk escalating from a financial afterthought to a hazard that makes investors think twice and could complicate the operations in a way that really could slow this, this rapidly burgeoning um, um, uh, space, uh, um, uh, space ecosystem. And so in the long run, um, it really doesn't make sense for the worst case scenario to have to happen in order for us to make sure that we focus on the favorable economics of this new space. So finally, as I've long said, our efforts at the FCC do not, of course, exists in a vacuum. Earlier this month, NASA funded several academic studies into the economic, social, and policy issues around space debris. A bipartisan group of senators also introduced legislation to jumpstart the development of debris removal technology. I continue to believe the FCC must work collaboratively throughout the government, uh, but we must leverage our collective expertise here as well. And as a licensing authority with no shortage, clearly of the applications that are before us, we are right to move ahead. So uh, again, thank you to the International Bureau for their hard work in particular on this item. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Commissioner Starks, and thank you for also participating in our own kind of historic first. I, I think I can say with some authority, this is the first hybrid meeting featuring a member of the FCC in Bucharest. And with that, we will turn to Commissioner Symington. Thank you. Um, I couldn't possibly match my colleague's eloquence in talking about the, the uh, terrible situations in Florida and Puerto Rico, but I hope I can at least match them in my intensity of concern and in my appreciation for the uh, efforts of the many FCC staff uh, involved, uh, whether that's here or whether that's directly on the ground. And of course, the recovery effort um, never is, is never easy and takes a long time, so it's, it's my hope that we'll be as flexible and collegial as possible, in, uh, as I know we will in uh, doing what we can to contribute to uh, the restoration of normalcy. Uh, turning to the, uh, the item before us. Today, the Commission adopts a rule requiring non-geostationary satellite operators to deorbit satellites within five years after the completion of their missions. We require both that domestic licensees and foreign operators granted access to the United States market responsibly dispose of satellites that have served their purpose. This order marks what I hope is the dawn of a new regulatory approach to the space economy. Rules that are tough, sensible, and performance-based. Rules that I hope will form the bedrock of a safe, sustainable, and innovative space economy. Let me be clear. Orbital debris is a problem, but not a crisis. Not yet. And operators might well be forgiven for wondering where the fire is. Indeed, we may in the fullness of time come to discover that active debris removal technologies prove more than adequate to meet the challenge of debris generation or that close coordination among operators in the sharing of ephemeris data and mutual cooperation in conjunction management work just fine without our intervention. We may come to learn that, in other words, the Commission's rules uh, develop to be a largely unused backstop for best-in-class commercial practices. Our rules may soon be superannuated by innovative solutions from responsible operators who recognize that for any operator to succeed, each must operate with an eye towards safety and sustainability. That could happen. And in fact, I hope it does happen. But what we can't do is bet exclusively on that. Hope is not a plan. And the operating environment of the past, of a few large, high-altitude satellites, is fading from memory at a rate that feels like a step change from just five years ago. At the FCC, we often talk of the spectrum pipeline. Well, get a load of the satellite pipeline. Over the next decade, commercial operators plan to launch tens of thousands of new satellites into orbits. A veritable Cambrian explosion of commercial space operations is just over the horizon, and we had better be ready when it arrives. I will not reel off examples of various tragedies of the commons or other regulatory failures, except to observe that we've waited too long before, and it has not always gone well. Each of you may have a different one in mind, which is sure testimony of our sometimes inability to learn this lesson. That is, there's no worse time to draw up ex-ante ex rules for uh, peaceful and productive coexistence than in the throes of an ex post crisis. So we must act now. We must seize this moment. The moment practically calls out for it. The United States represents something like 50% of the international space economy. We therefore have, through the option of extending our orbital debris rules to any who seek US market access, a regulatory hook for creating a default rule book for commercial operators globally. We can create a unitary set of clear and flexible rules for space commercial space operation and we can apply that standard to any who seek access to our market. And as things stand, that's a powerful, even irresistible incentive. This is a lane, then, for American leadership in what is arguably the most innovative commercial industry. But it can close if we do nothing. Our present leadership in the space economy is not promised forever, and strong rules can be winnowed through consensus-driven, multi-stakeholder bodies constrained by heckler's vetoes. It's entirely possible to miss this opportunity. The United States has the most innovative and largest space economy in the world. It has a ready-made mechanism in the Commission to promulgate rules for the entire international commercial space market, and it has compelling natural incentives for compliance. There is bipartisan support to act to lead on an issue that has, it is fair to say, the world's attention. The ancient Greeks had a term called kairos, which means the perfect opportunity, not just a now, but a right now. There is more we can do, and right now is the right now. I cannot begin to thank enough those within the Commission who have worked diligently, thoughtfully, and creatively on this item. My sincere thanks to the International Bureau and to all staff um, for their work on this. My thanks as well to my fellow Commissioners and their staffs who have worked hard to implement targeted changes to the language of the item. And my thanks especially to Chairwoman Rosenworcel and her staff. While the Chairwoman well knows that I view this order as a first step into a new era, I cannot thank her enough for her visionary leadership in getting us to this point. 
I look forward to working with her and all my colleagues within the agency and without it to craft sensible rules for a new space age. And suffice it to say, this item has my support. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Symington, for your sense of urgency. All right, today we take the next step in our space innovation agenda. We take action to care for our skies in order to promote strength and sustainability in the space economy. Right now, there are thousands of tons of orbital debris in the air above, and it's going to grow. We need to address it, because if we don't, this space junk could constrain new opportunities. To explain why, you can look back at the first space age. You know, for billions of years, space was not a landscape for human endeavors. And then the space race began, and in 1958, NASA sent Vanguard 1 into our skies, and it still circles the planet today. Now, at the time it was launched, Vanguard 1 was a bold undertaking and a commitment to our connected future. But today it also represents something else, a reminder of the work we have to do to address orbital debris. Since 1957, humanity's put about 10,000 satellites into the sky. More than half of those satellites are now defunct. Many of them were just launched with the understanding that it was cheaper to just abandon them to than to actually spend to take them out of orbit. That means, like Vanguard 1, they stay in orbit for decades, careening around our increasingly crowded skies as space junk. That's bad because it raises the risk of collisions that harm satellites we count on, makes it harder to launch new objects into higher orbits, and even has environmental consequences here on Earth. Now, for years, it has been the recommended practice for satellite operators to deorbit their spacecraft within 25 years of completing their mission. But 25 years is a long time. There is no reason to wait that long anymore, especially in low Earth orbit. Our space economy is moving fast. The second space age is here. For it to continue to grow, we need to do more to clean up after ourselves so space innovation can continue to respond. So that brings me to right now. With an eye to the future, today we adopt rules that shorten this period for satellites in low Earth orbit from 25 years to five years. That's big. It will mean more accountability and less risk of collisions that increase orbital debris and the likelihood of space communication failures. So I want to thank my colleagues for joining me and taking this important step to adopt this first-of-a-kind adjustment to our rules. I want to also thank the expert staff who worked on this effort, including Alexandra Horn, Samuel Carty, Carl Kensinger, Sankar Perswad, Tom Sullivan, Troy Tanner, Marissa Velez, and Patrick Weber from the International Bureau. Linda Chang, Thomas Derenge, Georgios Laris, and Joshua Smith from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, Raphael Snader, and Ashley Tyson from the Enforcement Bureau, Damian Ariza, Nicholas Oros, and Thomas Struble from the Office of Engineering and Technology, Jerry Duval, Kate Matraves, Emily Talaga, and Alex Yankovic from the Office of Economics and Analytics, Deborah Broderson, Dave Conscal, and Bill Richardson from the Office of General Counsel and Maura McGowan and Joy Ragsdale from the Office of Communications Business Opportunities. And with that, we will proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Vote to approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, please announce the next item on today's agenda. Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, Item two on your agenda is titled Calling Services for Incarcerated People and will be presented by the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. Alejandro Wark, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Mr. Roark, please proceed. Thank you. I wanted to make sure everybody was seated. <laughs> Uh, good morning, Madam Chairwoman uh, and Commissioners. The Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau and Wireline Competition Bureau are pleased to present for your consideration a fourth report in order and six further notice of proposed rulemaking on calling services for incarcerated people. If adopted, the item would improve access to communication services for incarcerated people with communication disabilities and reduce the financial burdens created by certain charges and practices. I'd like to thank uh, both bureaus uh, and their teams for their hard work on this item. 
Um, and I'd also like to thank our colleagues from the Office of Economics and Analytics, the Office of General Counsel, the Office of the Managing Director, the Office of Communications Business Opportunities, and the Enforcement Bureau for their contributions to this item. Joining me today are CGB Front Office Legal Advisor Bob Aldrich, uh, who will present the item, uh, Simon uh, Salmani, an Attorney Advisor in the Pricing Policy Division, who will present the Wireline Competition Bureau's portion of the item. And also joining us at the table are Diane Bernstein, a Deputy Bureau Chief, and Elia Greenwald, a Deputy Chief of the Disability Rights Office, as well as Terry Natoli, Associate Chief of the Wireline Competition Bureau, uh, Bill Kehoe, Senior Counsel in the Pricing Policy Division. Bob, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you and good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. If adopted, this item would take important steps to improve access to communication services for incarcerated people with communication disabilities. In the fourth report and order, the Commission would amend its rules to require that inmate calling services providers provide access to all relay services eligible for telecommunications relay services or TRS fund support in any correction, in, excuse me, in any correctional facility where broadband service is available and where the average daily population incarcerated in the correctional system of that jurisdiction totals 50 or more persons. The additional services to which access would be required include video relay service, internet protocol caption telephone service, and internet protocol relay service, as well as the ability to make point-to-point -point video calls using American Sign Language. Where broadband is not available, providers would be required to provide access to relay services that do not depend on internet access. These access requirements are necessarily subject to the condition that the correctional authority does not refuse to permit such access. The commission also would amend its rules to clarify and expand the scope of restrictions on charging for TRS calls, expand the scope of the required annual reports to reflect expanded TRS access, and modify TRS user registration requirements to facilitate the use of TRS by eligible incarcerated persons. The further notice seeks comment on whether to amend the Commission's rules to allow a form of enterprise registration for internet protocol caption telephone service in carceral settings, proposes to require access to advanced TRS and point-to-point -point video in jurisdictions where the average daily population of the correctional system is less than 50 incarcerated persons, and proposes that charges for inmate calling services be disclosed to users with disabilities in accessible formats. I will now turn it over to Simon, who will present the Wireline Competition Bureau's portions of the item. Thank you, Bob. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Now that you have heard what the item proposes to do with respect to advancing disabilities access for incarcerated persons, I will explain the measures it takes to improve calling services for incarcerated individuals and their families and loved ones. The report and order, if adopted, would adopt rules prohibiting providers from seizing or otherwise disposing of unused balances in calling accounts until at least 180 calendar days of continuous account inactivity have passed and requiring refunds of unused balances. Lower the caps on third-party ancillary services fees, including those related to calls that are not covered by an account with the service provider to $3 when payment is made using an automated system or $5.95 when payment is made using a live agent's assistance. Amend the Commission's definitions of jail and prison to include every type of facility where individuals can be incarcerated or detained, consistent with the Commission's intent when it adopted these definitions in 2015. The sixth further notice of proposed rulemaking, if adopted, would seek comment on a variety of topics designed to aid the Commission in adopting further calling services reforms to benefit incarcerated people. Specifically, the sixth further notice would seek comment on refining the rules for the treatment of balances in inactive accounts based on a more robust record, expanding the breadth and scope of the Commission's existing inmate calling service providers consumer disclosure rules, maximizing the use of recently submitted data in response to the Commission's third mandatory data collection to establish just and reasonable, permanent, interstate and international inmate calling services rate caps and associated ancillary service charges, and permitting pilot programs offering alternative pricing structures. The Consumer and Governmental Affairs and Wireline Competition Bureaus 
recommend adoption of the item and request editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear comments from the bench. Commissioner Carr. Thanks so much to the team that's been working on this. You know, um, cutting off all forms of communications, all connections uh, between incarcerated people and their family is not part of the sentence that they receive. And yet too often it is a clear practical consequence that flows from being incarcerated. And for years the FCC has worked to try to address that including um, with Commissioner and then Acting Chair Clyburn leading the charge to address some of this. We've worked to do it because the fact is that, that in too many cases uh, rates have been unreasonable, they've been too high, they've acted as a barrier uh, to people connecting with family and loved ones, um, even legal counsel in some cases. So we've worked to try to improve that, we've worked to try to end uh, the inequity there. There's been limits on our statutory authority, courts have sort of sent cases back to us. I'm glad that we've uh, attempted to make progress there um, and there's no area where the barriers haven't been higher than when it comes uh, to those that are deaf, hard of hearing, deaf blind, have a speech disability. Uh, so I really want to commend the chair and her team for identifying this as a, an area where uh, we can, hopefully consistent with our statu statutory authority, make some additional progress. So I'm happy to, to support this item and very much look forward uh, to the record that, that uh, develops. So it has my support. Thanks. Thank you. Now we'll hear from Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. The research into the impact of incarceration is clear. Contact by phone and other forms of visitation between incarcerated individuals and their families reduces recidivism and has positive effects for both the incarcerated individual, his or her family, and the public. Yet we still continue to fight against restrictive conduct by providers that constrains incarcerated individuals from access to the outside world. And for incarcerated individuals who are deaf, hard of hearing, deaf blind, or who have speech disabilities, contact with loved ones can be even more challenging. And so today we take a critical step in the right direction for ensuring that these individuals have functionally equivalent means of communication that is equal to their peers. We must ensure that those who need services such as video relay services, caption, Telephone services are receiving those resources in their facilities. Failure to do so ensures that these individuals will continue to effectively be forced to live in as one former incarcerated individual, Alfonso Taylor described in the record, as living in solitary confinement. And so I hope we move quickly as well to apply this obligation to all facilities with incarcerated individuals and move to eliminate the requirement that it only applies to those with an average daily population of 50. Uh, or more. Additionally, this item seeks comment on other improvements to our inmate calling rules. I continue to support ensuring that rates for incarcerated individuals are just and reasonable. I'm glad to also see a continued push for improved data collection to help us move forward towards appropriate rate caps. Previous collections, in my estimation, have been subpar, and we must ensure that we have strong data to appropriately act. And so I'd like to thank Commission staff for the hard work also like to take time uh, to thank um, um, Senator Tammy Duckworth, uh, Rob Portman, Cory Booker, Brian Schatz, all who have worked to introduce bipartisan bill earlier this year, similarly focused on ensuring just and reasonable charges for our nation's incarcerated population. That, as I have said publicly as well, has my support. So I appreciate uh, the continued leadership on this issue. It has my support. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. Thank you. I'm happy to support this item, which takes several strong steps to correct market failures in the inmate calling services market. Inmates do not have the ability to switch to competing providers, and correctional institutions have limited incentives to focus on disabled inmates and inmate calling costs when they negotiate contracts and choose providers. These are exactly the kinds of market failures our regulatory powers are designed to correct. So I'd like to thank the chair and her team for bringing this issue forward and the uh, diverse staff from uh, uh, several bureaus who've worked hard uh, to get it over the line. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Incarcerated people who are deaf, hard of hearing, deaf blind, or who have a speech disability are often in a prison within a prison. 
All too often, they find basic communication services are not even available. In fact, the record before us describes how some incarcerated people who are deaf were not aware of the COVID virus until more than a year into the pandemic. One deaf individual who was previously an inmate told us that he was always the last to hear about food, announcements, and basic information. Others told us about how deeply alone they were, unable to communicate with loved ones and legal representation outside of prison. This is not right. And it ends right here today. In this decision, the FCC requires that prison phone providers offer access to all relay services supported by the Telecommunications Relay Fund, as well as American Sign Language point-to-point -point video communications. In other words, thanks to our action, those with disabilities who are incarcerated will have a right to basic communications that has too often been disregarded and forgotten. We are committed to fixing it. We are also committed to continuing the effort to ensure calling rates are affordable and fair for all. That is why today we also reform our rules to lower the caps on ancillary service charges and put an end to abusive tactics like providers refusing to refund balances with inactive accounts. In addition, we seek further comment on how to use new data from prison phone providers to set permanent rates that are just and reasonable. Every one of these steps is progress. Every one of them is a movement towards prison phone justice, and we won't stop until the job is done. For today's actions, I want to start by thanking my former colleague and friend, Mignon Clyburn. She pressed this agency to act on prison phone rates again and again, and she did it when it would be easier to look the other way. So we're going to continue to take steps and make the progress she called for so rightfully and consistently. Thank you also to the terrific team at the agency who worked so hard to ensure that those who are incarcerated and their families can communicate. And that includes Bob Aldrich, Diane Burstein, Elliot Greenwald, Joshua Mendelson, Ike Ofebike, Alejandro Roark, Michael Scott, and Ross Slutsky from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. Sharon Lee from the Enforcement Bureau, Susan Barr, Ahuva Bottoms, Peter Bean, Elizabeth Kuttner, Amy Good. Trent Harkrader, Bill Kehoe, Lee McFarland, Terry Natoli, Eric Raven Hansen, Zach Ross, Gunjan Shah, Simon Soleimani, Haley Steffen, Gil Strobel, and Jennifer Vickers from the Wireline Competition Bureau, Maura McGowan from the Office of Communications Business Opportunities, Sarah Citrin, Valerie Hill, Marcus Mayer, Rick Mallon, and Bill Richardson from the Office of General Counsel. Connor Altman, Stephen Kaufman, Eugene Kisilev, Richard Kwiatkowski, Susan Lee, Kim Mathkutch, Eric Ralph, and Andrew Wise from the Office of Economics and Analytics, and finally, Andrew Mullitz and Somitra Dias from the Office of Managing Director. We will now proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. And the chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, please announce the next item on today's agenda. Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, item three on your agenda is titled Improving Accessibility and Clarity of Emergency Alerts and will be presented by the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. Deborah Jordan, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Good morning, Chairwoman Rosen Worsell and Commissioners. The emergency alert system is a powerful tool for public safety officials to quickly send warnings and information about dangerous situations to the public using cable, over-the-air broadcast, and satellite networks. This system delivers thousands of life-saving alerts to consumers, TVs, and radios every year. We've seen it in frequent use, for example, during hurricanes Fiona and Ian. While these alerts deliver information to the public in both visual and audio formats, the visual and audio content are not always identical. The visual version, that is the text that crawls across the top of the TV screen, often provides less detailed information. What's more, that information may be unclear. And in cases where the audio portion is generated from the same information used to create the video content, that audio can be unclear and difficult to understand as well. 
This makes the alert messages less valuable to all Americans, especially people who are deaf or hard of hearing. Today, we present to you a report and order in, on, to significantly improve the clarity and accessibility of emergency alert system messages to the public, including people with hearing disabilities. The order would achieve this goal by leveraging the capacity of the newest internet-based technology to transmit alerts and by assuring that the alert messages contain plain, easy to understand terminology rather than technical jargon. With me today from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau are David Firth, Deputy Bureau Chief, David Saratsky, Deputy Chief of the Policy and Licensing Division, and Chris Fidelli. I would also like to thank the other Bureau staff who worked on this item, as well as the other Bureaus and offices that contributed. Now to Chris. Thank you, Chief Jordan. <clears throat> Good morning, Chairwoman and Commissioners. The Emergency Alert System, or EAS, uses two methods for transmitting alert messages from the government entities that originate them to the cable systems, radio and TV broadcasters, and other entities that deliver them to the public. The original method, known as legacy EAS, involves formatting alerts in an older protocol for over-the-air transmission signals, which the participating systems and stations monitor, retransmit, and ultimately deliver to consumers' radio receivers and television screens. In the newer internet-based method, government entities send their alerts over broadband connections to the Federal Emergency Management Agency's Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, or IPAWS, which then distributes the alerts over the internet to broadcasters, cable systems, and other ES participants that transmit them to the public. These alert messages are format formatted in an IP-based format known as the Common Alerting Protocol, or CAP, which provides greater capabilities for transmitting more detailed information and video messages, as well as higher qual quality audio. The item before you would direct EAS participants to disseminate as many alert messages as possible in the internet-based CAP format rather than the old legacy EAS format. It would also make certain national alert messages clearer and easier to understand. First, the report and order requires that if a broadcaster cable system or other ES participant receives both a legacy format, state or local alert message, and a duplicate message in the CAP format, it must transmit the CAP alert rather than the legacy version to the public, so as to take advantage of CAP's superior visual and audio messaging capabilities. If an EAS participant receives a legacy format message, it must promptly check the IPAWS system to see if a duplicate alert is available in CAP format, and if so, it must transmit the CAP version. Second, the report and order revises certain of the terms that cable systems, broadcasters, and other entities are required to use in the national alert messages that they transmit to the public. The new terms use plain language rather than technical jargon in order to make it easier to understand the visual and audio messages generated for all national alerts, whether sent in the internet-based CAP version or in the legacy format. The Bureau recommends the Commission adopt this report in order and request editorial privileges for technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear comments from the bench. Commissioner Carr. Thanks so much to the team. Uh, emergency alerts save lives. We are seeing that right now. Uh, in Florida with Hurricane Ian. It's a stark reminder of the importance of these alerts, particularly where you have storms that the exact point of landfall is unclear up until hours ahead of time. So it makes it very difficult to get a lot of actual information out early. So EAS sometimes is uh, particularly key in those situations. Uh, today's items ensures that people who are deaf or hard of hearing will have access to alerts in a viewable format that more closely matches the audible versions of such alert messages. We're also taking measures to ensure that people who are blind or visually impaired will have access on their radios to national alerts containing more detailed audio information. And we're taking steps to make sure that the language used for our national alert codes are in plain language, uh, making it easier for more people to understand them. I think these are gonna be important actions that hopefully are gonna even further improve the system. Um, stepping back again, one thing that I wanted to note at, at the top before uh, was that the chair has stood up a website where a lot of our information on Hurricane 
in including status reports are and are going to be um, included. Uh, the chair also has up there a lot of tips for communications providers uh, as well as for consumers. So that's FCC.gov slash Ian. So I would encourage people to look at that. You know, finally, we took some steps um, a couple months ago to improve upon the voluntary resiliency framework. This were um, ideas that came out of a, a visit that the chair and I did uh, to Louisiana last year after a hurricane. Um, and I would simply sort of encourage all of the, the mobile wireless carriers out there to look to be very quickly uh, opening up roaming, which can be a very effective way of getting people help. You can have a, a cell phone on a one carrier that has been essentially bricked if that particular carrier site happens to go down, but they can still receive a signal, potentially, from another carrier. And so I would encourage, even though we're still under the voluntary uh, regime we've had for a while as our, as our new one continues to, to roll out, uh, I would encourage carriers to be moving very quickly on requests, responding to each other very quickly to make sure where uh, roaming in an emergency is possible, that we're doing it right now uh, when the minutes and hours are so vitally, vitally critical. So thanks, and this item has my support. Thank you. Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Every time I make a statement about our emergency alert system, there is, unfortunately, it seems a too recent extreme weather event to turn to that illustrates its critical importance. Days before the five-year anniversary of Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, Hurricane Fiona barreled over the island, bringing more than 20 inches of rain, causing flash flooding triggering mudslides and leaving the entire territory without power. The same weekend, remnants of a typhoon caused one of the strongest storms in more than a decade to strike Alaska, causing hurricane force winds and dangerous coastal flooding. And now, of course, we see Hurricane Ian bringing severe damage there to Florida and um, uh, potentially other parts of the East Coast. As ever, my thoughts and prayers go out to all of those who are affected and will be rebuilding uh, both property and their lives for days to come. These, event, these events affect every corner of our country. It's never been more important for all Americans to have timely, clear, and detailed notice of emergency events. The rules we adopt today help serve that goal. The order makes sure that when available, broadcasters and MVPDs will transmit alerts in the IP-based Common Alerting Protocol, CAP format, rather than the legacy format. CAP alerts enable the agency initiating the alert to provide more detailed information and especially important, especially important for deaf and hard of hearing individuals, ensure that all of the information is included in the visual alert displayed on the TV screen, as well as the audio alert. And so even if not all agencies are using the CAP format yet, it is still important that our EAS participants begin to check for these alerts to future-proof the system going forward. And so I also support the common sense updates the order makes to the prescribed language corresponding to the three national EAS alert codes. And with these rules in place, millions of Americans will benefit from clearer and more detailed information during emergencies. Thank you to the team for their hard work, and thank you uh, as well to the chairwoman, uh, who clearly has um, uh, prioritized the, the, the natural disasters that consistently seem to be coming our way and making sure that we're being thoughtful on, on helping uh, see Americans through uh, these, these hard times and hard points in their lives. So thank you. It has my support. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. Uh, thank you. About a year ago, I had the privilege of visiting in person NOAA facilities in Florida and observing uh, not only their immense technical sophistication, I can't stress enough just how sophisticated they are in detecting adverse weather events, obviously with an emphasis on hurricanes and, and tracking those, but also the, the huge emphasis that they placed on communications. So, uh, for example, sh showing me their press center, they made clear that it was designed to get through people through as quickly as possible so that as much information that's as granular as possible Possible, could go out to people who were potentially implicated, as well as to people who weren't, so that they wouldn't uh, overly tax infrastructure or facilities. And they made very, very clear to me, something I had just not grasped before, that information and communication with the public is uh, an absolutely critical part of success in their mission. So from my perspective, these common sense reforms will make emergency alerts less confusing and more accessible. That's strictly good. I'm happy to support them, and I want to thank everyone for their hard work on it. Thank you, Commissioners. 
At this very moment, as you all know, Hurricane Ian is racing across Florida. A few weeks ago, one of its predecessors, Hurricane Fiona, did damage to Puerto Rico. A year ago, it was Hurricane Ida that came ashore and wreaked havoc in Louisiana. And of course, Commissioner Carr and I saw the aftermath of that storm when we visited the Bayou State. It might even be a year ago to the date. And of course, just a few years before that, Hurricane Maria barreled through Puerto Rico, leaving historic destruction in its wake, destruction that I also saw in person, along with, and this is important, the resilience of the people and communities affected. All right, there's a pattern here. Climate change is making storms more frequent, more dangerous, and more damaging. We need to respond in kind. That's because keeping communications networks up and running can save lives, ensuring they deliver the right emergency information to people at the right time can keep communities safe. So today we update our emergency alert system to make sure the messages it provides are clear for everyone. And to understand why, it is important to know that when we turn on our television screens to get information about an impending weather event or other disaster, there is both a recorded EAS message and a text crawl. To avoid confusion, of course, this should be the same information. But because of the nature of the legacy architecture of television, the recorded message does not always match the visual text. It often contains less information and thus has resulted in problems, especially when it comes to people with disabilities who may be uniquely vulnerable in disaster situations. Today, we end that confusion. We clear up this mismatch by requiring EAS participants to check whether the newest internet-based protocol version of the alert exists, and we direct them to use it if it does. This is valuable because this version provides more details like how those receive it should respond to the emergency, and these actions matter because they modernize one of our most important systems for emergency response. In light of the growing frequency of devastating weather events, it is essential we do so. Thank you to the staff responsible for this effort to make these alerts both clearer and more accessible. And that includes Maureen Bisco, Steve Carpenter, John Evanoff, Chris Fidelli, David Firth, Deb Jordan, Nicole McGinnis, Dave Munson, Austin Rendazzo, and David Saratsky from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. Doug Klein, Marcus Mara, and Bill Richardson from the Office of General Counsel, Chuck Needy, Emily Talaga, and Alex Yankovich from the Office of Economics and Analytics, Susie Singleton, and William Wallace from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, Hilary DeNegro, Brendan Holland, Evan Morris, Maria Malarkey from the Media Bureau, Eric Ehrenreich, Sharon Lee, Jeremy Marcus, Philip Rosario, and Ashley Tyson from the Enforcement Bureau, Zachary Ross from the Wireline Petition Bureau, and Chana Wilkerson from the Office of Communications Business Opportunities. We'll proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, please announce the next item on today's agenda. Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, the fourth and final item on your agenda, removing obsolete, obsolete analog TV rules, will be presented by the Media Bureau, and Holly Sauer, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Ms. Sauer, please proceed. Good morning, Chairwoman and Commissioners. Today, the Media Bureau presents a notice of proposed rulemaking seeking comment on comprehensively deleting, updating, or otherwise revising the Commission's Part 73 rules. These rules, which pertain to full power and Class A television stations, need to be updated following the transition from analog to digital only operations and the post incentive auction transition. Emily Harrison from the Video Division, for her first time, will present the item. Thanks, Holly. Good morning, Chairwoman and Commissioners. All full power television stations were statutorily mandated to complete a nationwide digital television transition by June 12, 2009, and Class A stations transition by September 1, 2015. In addition, the Commission's incentive auction closed on April 13, 2017, and the post incentive auction period for stations to transition off their pre-auction channel ended on July 13, 2020.
the NPRM proposes to eliminate entire rules or portions of rules that provide analog operating requirements or otherwise refer to DTV or digital as these distinctions are no longer necessary given the transition. The NPRM also proposes to delete outdated rules that are no longer valid given changes in commission adapted policy such as the decades old elimination of the comparative hearing process to award and renew broadcast licenses. In addition, the NPRM proposes to update the Part 73 rules to include accurate information about current commission forms and filing procedures, including the removal of obsolete forms. To make Part 73 rules easier to find and thus more practical for users, the NPRM proposes to reorganize Subpart E while also offering some minor clarifications and amendments to some of the rules and update cross-references to the rules. Finally, the NPRM proposes to make other technical and miscellaneous updates to the Commission's rules, such as eliminating references to the Commission's analog subscription television rules, clarifying the Commission's distributed transmission transmission system rule and transport stream ID requirements, updating the coordinates in the Commission's rules, requiring Class A stations within a certain distance of the U.S.-Mexico border to specify a full-service emission mask in any modification applications, and making other corrections. The Media Bureau recommends that the Commission adopt this notice of proposed rulemaking and request editorial privileges to make any necessary technical or conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll now hear comments from the bench. Commissioner Carr. Uh, thanks so much to the team for the work on this. As we uh, just went over, there's some uh, at least two different historic transitions that are coming together uh, in TV that uh, may very well necessitate a comprehensive review and update, so I'm more than happy to uh, support this NPRM and, and see where the record goes. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Starks. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. No particular comment from me obviously makes sense from a good governance uh, standpoint for us to remove some of these absolute rules, uh, and so thank you to the team for the hard work. Commissioner Symington. Thank you. Yes, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the um, the complexity and sophistication of the effort needed uh, to, to get this done. It's, uh, it's not the most glamorous kind of infrastructure work, but it's vitally important, and I'm glad, glad to know that we'll be able to rely on it in the years ahead. Not glamorous. Anyway, all right. Thank you, commissioners. I remember when my household was such that we all viewed video on a single screen. There was just the television. But times have changed because we now watch what we want whenever we want it on whatever screen is handy. That's an extraordinary transformation. And to make it happen, the broadcast television industry had to undergo two of the most sweeping transitions in history. First, the industry switched from old analog operations to digital only broadcasting. Second, we held an incentive auction at this agency to repurpose airwaves for new uses, which required the industry to adapt to a new television band that was built for the modern era. Now that we've made our way through these big transitions, some of our broadcast television rules need to be revised, and some are just simply no longer relevant. So today we work to fix that. We are seeking comment in order to remove our outdated rules relating to analog television and update are largely technical rules regarding broadcast television. All right, thank you so much to the staff who worked on this extremely glamorous effort. <laughs> We're gonna roll out the red carpet for Bobby Baker, Joyce Bernstein, Mark Colombo, Hilary DeNegro, Kevin Harding, Emily Harrison, Barbara Kreisman, Sean Mayer, Maria Malarkey, Alex Sangenis, Holly Sauer, and Lisa Scanlon from the Media Bureau. James McLucky from the International Bureau, Roger Noel and Mary Claire York from the Wireless Bureau, Martin Doscat and Ira Kelts from the Office of Engineering and Technology, Brian Marenko from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, Susan Aaron, David Conscal, and Bill Richardson from the Office of General Counsel, Michelle Schaefer from the Office of Economics and Analytics, Joy Ragsdale from the Office of Communications Business Opportunities, and Tobias Mikowski from the FCC Library. All right, we'll proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. 
The chair votes aye. The items adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Would any of my colleagues like to make any announcements at this time? Commissioner Carr. Uh, I have one. We have our uh, fall semester intern, who I believe is here in person, uh, Terry Eisman. Terry, where are you? You have to stand up. It's part of the whole shindig, you know. Uh, everyone's got to get a good look. Uh, he's our, our fall intern. He's currently at 2L at GW Law School here in Washington, D.C. Uh, prior to coming to Washington for law school, Terry graduated from UCLA with a BA in political science and double minor in uh, Israel studies and Russian studies as well. Terry also worked in broadcasting during his undergrad time in LA, which sort of makes sense in LA. Uh, he covered the Oscars for the Today Show. He pitched and produced an Emmy-nominated profile piece uh, on what I'll call the DC restaurant tour now sometimes, but started in LA, Wolfgang Puck, uh, and booked and conducted over 30 uh, interviews for live and taped pieces. So he continues now to be an avid podcaster. Maybe we'll find a way to get him involved in the, the FCC podcast at some point. Uh, but we're excited to have him on board. So he's already been pitching in and doing some great work. Uh, so thanks so much, Terry, for, uh, for joining us. Thanks. Commissioner Starks, do you have any announcements? I do. Thank you briefly, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, if it's September, you know my office is going to have a new round of interns as well. I'd like to um, uh, announce them here first. Uh, it, it is three uh, talented women um, uh, this fall. I'm very excited. Jade Poorman is a 3L at the University of Dayton School of Law. Welcome. Uh, she's already hard at work. Uh, Anisha Dutt is a 2L at Stetson University College of Law. Uh, and uh, last but not least is um, this semester's early career staff diversity initiative intern. I'm very proud to have her is Avelia Kim, a 2L at American University College of Law. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. Thank you. No announcements at this time. All right. Thank you, commissioners, and everyone get comfortable. I got a long list. We're going to start with some retirements. And I want to call out some people for many, many years of public service. And that starts with Grace Teeny, who is retiring after a multi-decade career at the FCC. She started in what was called the Broadcast Public Reference Room. And later, she moved on to what was known as the Office of Science and Technology and worked on the FCC's conversion of its broadcast call sign application system from a manual process, a manual process, to an online application system. Grace closed out her career in the Media Bureau, and we wish her all the best in her retirement. After nearly 22 years of dedicated service at the FCC, Margaret Daly, who is senior counsel in the Investigation and Hearings Division of the Enforcement Bureau, is starting a new chapter in her life with her well-earned retirement. She's a terrific attorney, someone I had the benefit of working with earlier in my career. In addition to her time in the Enforcement Bureau, she worked in the Front Office and Pricing Division of the Wireline Competition Bureau. She's made meaningful contributions to so many areas at the Commission, including what's known as the Virginia Arbitration, Number Portability, Special Access, and Rural Call Completion. And her investigatory and legal skill in a 2018 case resulted in a $40 million settlement. I want to point out that it is one of the largest in the FCC's history. Her colleagues are going to miss her legendary dry wit. And boy, this one, I don't know, exemplary blue book skills. <laughs> All right. Belford Lawson retired on September 1st, 2022, with over 45 years of service combined in D.C. government and FCC work. He started his FCC career working in the media and international bureaus, then transferred to the Office of Communications Business Opportunities, where he served for 34 years. We are grateful for your service. I also want to recognize Tim McGuire for his outstanding engineering contributions to the agency as he retires next month. Tim's worn many hats in his 29 years at the FCC, starting in the OET lab before moving to the Wireless Bureau, where he has been a leading contributor to many rulemaking, policy, and standard setting efforts. Tim's represented the agency in negotiations with both Canada and Mexico, as well as in standards bodies, and he's been an agency expert on topics from aviation to maritime to commercial mobile radio. So that means Tim has influenced how we communicate from the skies to the oceans to the phones in our pockets. So thank you, Tim, for your service. 
Rodney Small is retiring after 50 years at the FCC. He first joined the commission in 1972 as part of a large team doing a rate investigation of Ma Bell. And that investigation laid the groundwork for the breakup of the Bell system in 1982. In 1974, he moved to what is now called OET, where he remained for the rest of his career. He's been a key contributor to so many commission projects over the years, including the digital television transmission, streamlining experimental licensing rules, and more recently, our COVID telehealth program. We're sending our best wishes to him for his retirement. All right, we've got some awards. And I wanna talk a little bit about this year's winners for the commission's annual excellence in economic analysis and excellence in engineering awards. Now, when you lead this agency, you're constantly touting all the things that it is doing to improve the lives of people all across the country because communications is so important. One example, of course, is that last year, the FCC stood up the largest broadband affordability program in our nation's history. And we have other examples too, like earlier this year, a large swath of spectrum was made available to safely launch 5G service to millions. We are able to have these kind of headlines because of the work of civil servants. And many of those folks are largely anonymous. So today, with these awards, we're gonna make sure that four of our FCC colleagues get the recognition they deserve for making big things happen. First, I'm proud to announce that the winner of this year's Excellence in Economic Analysis Award is Mark Wakala from the Office of Economics and Analytics. Mac did invaluable behind the scenes work to get the emergency broadband benefit up and running in record time. His work was particularly critical to ensuring that we reduce waste, fraud, and abuse and make sure the program runs with integrity as it should. Next, it's my pleasure to announce that this year's Excellence in Engineering Award is going to three individuals. Robert Pavlak from the Office of Engineering and Technology, and Janet King Young and Kambiz Ranahavadi from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. They created complex models to assess new terrestrial broadband systems to ensure they would avoid harmful interference. Their work created a path forward for wireless carriers to deploy 5G services in accordance with their licenses while also ensuring safety in our national airspace. Now, the FCC is blessed with some really remarkable, talented staff, and today we're gonna recognize some of the best of the best, so congratulations, Mac, Robert, Janet, and Cambiz. All right, finally, I wanna draw some attention to one of the agency's newest additions. As of this week, Denise Bambi Kraus will serve as the Chief of the Office of Native Affairs and Policy. I am so thrilled that Bambi is joining us. Her wealth of experience will be an asset as we work to ensure modern communications reach us all, including Native communities. Our Office of Native Affairs and Policy under her leadership will focus on four priority areas. The first is mapping and ensuring tribal participation in the process. The second is access with a focus particularly on tribal libraries and their new abilities to access support from the E-rate system. Third, we'll be focusing on affordability with a spotlight on promoting the Affordable Connectivity Program and its enhanced tribal benefit. And fourth, we are going to work to focus on sustainability and specifically long-term telecommunications infrastructure sustainability in Indian country. Thank you so much, Bambi, for joining us. All right, a few more. Hold on. I also want to re <laughs> welcome Dina Shetler to my office. Uh, she is a smart and seasoned veteran of this agency who's done more tours in more bureaus than anyone I think I know. She also formerly served in the Office of Managing Director, so she really knows what's going on at this agency and this building. She's spent time detailed to NTIA and also has worked at the Department of Justice's Antitrust Division. She was, in addition, an advisor to Gloria Tristani back when we called the eighth floor the eighth floor. She's a graduate of UCLA Law School and the University of California at San Diego, and she's going to help us as uh, Deputy Chief of Staff for administrative matters. We're thrilled to have Dina working with us in that role. One last development. Quite literally, just yesterday, Ramesh Nagarajan from my office, who serves as my legal advisor for wireline issues, welcomed with his wife, baby boy, Dev Choli Minoff Nagarajan. He is their third child. And he has reported to us that mother and baby are doing well. No commentary about this baby's two big sisters, but we assure them we should be confident they'll get accustomed to their new little brother in time. So we wish Ramesh and his family 
loads of good things, and of course, a little bit of sleep in the days ahead. I also want to thank Elizabeth Kuttner, who is joining my office while Ramesh is out on paternity leave. Madam Secretary, will you please announce the next date for the Commission's monthly agenda meeting? The next agenda meeting of the Federal Communications Commission is Thursday, October 27th, 2022. Until then, we stand adjourned. Special thanks to Commissioner Starks for making the effort to join us like this today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. If we could take private conversations either outside the room or if we could just you know, quiet down a little bit, we are going to start the post-open meeting press conference with Chairwoman Rosenworcel. I um, just want to give a quick welcome, a quick reminder on a few rules. Obviously, everything here is on record. If you could please introduce yourself and outlet, that's always helpful for us. And uh, with that, I'll turn it to the Chairwoman. Chairwoman? Thank you so much, Paloma. Uh, before we get started, I do want to just draw attention to some of the extraordinary work that's going on with respect to storm recovery and communications by FCC staff. Much of this applies to Hurricane Fiona as well, but I'm going to focus on Hurricane Ian because it's racing across Florida as we stand here and as we speak. I just want everyone to know we sent two teams down early to Florida to perform a baseline survey of communications, which helps us better understand storm recovery. Some of those individuals actually spent last night at the Sarasota Police Department without power or voice communications. They helped stand up a Wi-Fi link in order to make sure critical information was relayed. We have also put out multilingual PSAs. We set up our disaster information recovering system, part of our coordination with FEMA. We are in daily contact with state, local, and federal officials. And we um, also have been reaching out to the carriers about the state of their networks and also to encourage them to uh, more aggressively, in an early fashion, make sure that roaming is available on each other's networks to the extent they are functional based upon the changes we recently made to the uh, wireless resiliency framework. As you might have heard Commissioner Carr mention that when he was speaking. We're going to continue to monitor the situation, and we are absolutely committed to making sure that communications is restored and is recovered. With that, we can take some questions. Uh, Commissioner Matt Daneman, Communications Daily. Um, orbital debris-wise, the item itself indicated that other orbital debris issues, such as uh, uh, requiring maneuverability, that sort of thing, will be handled at a later date. Do you anticipate other orbital debris orders still this year? What, and why take this kind of piecemeal approach as opposed to more omnibus orbital debris or item today? Why, why break this up? These are just complex issues. We're still reviewing the record. We reached uh, agreement on the issue of bringing the 25-year retirement rule or guideline down to five years. And we decided that in light of the growth of the space economy and the satellite sector, now was a good time to act rather than later. Good morning, Chairwoman. Gabrielle Novello, Communications Daily. Um, so I have a mapping question. I was hoping you could uh, give us an update on where things are. I understand right now the challenge process is going on for the fabric. Um, when will that end? Uh, when will the actual availability data challenge process start and end? And um, do you have an idea of whether the first iteration of the new maps will come out before year's end? So the way that I look at mapping is this is not one and done. It's a process. We are building a process so that this agency and this country going forward will have accurate information. It's something we should have started years ago, but we are doing it right now. And the first challenge process, as you mentioned, is the fabric challenge process. The broadband fabric is required under the Broadband Data Act. It is the development of a map of all buildable locations in the United States. That's a big effort. It entails everything from property tax review to uh, tax assessment docu documents to 
uh, reviews of satellite images, and a whole bunch of other things to make sure that we get all of those locations on the map. We are now taking challenges to those underlying locations on the fabric, and that it is our expectation that mid-November we will be able to publish a first draft, first iteration of these maps so that we can take in challenges with respect to availability. It's um, a complex process under the law, but we're committed to getting it done. Lynn Stanton, TR Daily. Um, what's your reaction to calls to rescind or stay the legato order in light of the National Academy's report on interference to high precision GPS receivers? And also, when, is the, when are the commissioners likely to have an order to consider on the 12 gigahertz band proceeding? Uh, uh, we're still doing technical review on your second question. With uh, respect to your first, we're also reviewing that study right now. As a matter of record, I want you to know that in January of 2021, before I took the reins at this agency, I did vote to support a stay of the underlying legato decision. Thank you. Good morning, Chairwoman. Sanya Rao with CTFN. The third meeting of the White House Competition Council took place this week on September 26. I was hoping you can talk to us a little about the broadband nutrition label that was mentioned and what sort of timeline that we can see on the rulemaking. Uh, appreciate that. I did attend that remotely um, where we had discussion about a range of competition issues, including issues associated with junk fees and confusion for consumers when they look at the terms of service of any particular good or service, including broadband. Um, the broadband nutrition labels is something we've been working on. We have a statutory duty to make sure that we issue a decision on that by November 15th, and we're going to meet that date. All right. Another? Go. Sure. Oh, great. Matt Dandeman, Communications Daily. In light of the 13 gigahertz NOI that, that's just opened, how should we read that in terms of your thinking or where you're leaning on the 12 gigahertz band? In the 12 gigahertz proceeding? Well, how are you're, they you're speaking about height? different spectrum bands. You're talking about the 12.7 to 13.25 gigahertz band and the notice of inquiry that we have shared with our colleagues at NTIA. That is distinctly different from the one that is the subject of the um, OET re review right now um, with uh, involving DBS operators. So these are two different bands, though I will grant you that they are next door neighbors. Okay. Anything else? Come on. Okay. Lynn Stanton again from TR Daily. I wanted if you had any thoughts on this major questions doctrine issue um, in the, the courts. Uh, uh, Representative McCormick Rogers wrote to you recently about that and how it should impact what you think about in doing proceedings. And also, it's an issue that's been raised in uh, a pending court case challenging your long standing whole approach to uh, setting USF contribution factors and collecting money for that. So, what, how do you see that? We're reviewing the letter and making an effort to respond right now. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks all. Okay. Thanks everyone. I will call up my colleague, Katie Gorsak, who's gonna be leading the Bureau Press Conference. Katie, the floor's all yours. Hello everybody, okay. So we'll start off with uh, today's IB item on space innovation and orbital debris. Are there any questions on that item? Okay, IB. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I seem to still be on. I keep forgetting to turn it off. Lynn Stanton from TR Daily. Um, Commissioner. Uh, Symington mentioned that there were targeted changes made to, from the draft item, and could you tell us what they were? And also, were there any changes regarding eligibility for waivers of the new rule for which satellite operators sought clarification? Uh, so yeah, we, we did add clarifying language in three areas of the item um, after circulation. The first is we added language to clarify that specific concerns raised by large constellations are not being addressed in the item and may be addressed in further actions in the proceeding. The second area is we added language to clarify that circumstances under which parties may request a waiver of the rule in the event of a satellite failure or, another, or an anomaly outside of their control. Um, so we made that a little clearer 
when they request a waiver. And then the third area is we added language to clarify when licensees would need to file a modification in order to comply with the new rule. Uh, Matt Dandeman, Communications Daily. The item it had a footnote about looking at other orbital reissues down the road. Is IB expecting to have other draft orders circulated this year? What, what kind of time frame is IB thinking? Uh, we, we don't have any indication on time frame at this, at this point. Uh, we do anticipate further action in this proceeding, but we, do, we just don't have a time frame we could share with you today. Any others? All right, thank you. So we'll next move on to the uh, CGB and WCB item on calling services for incarcerated people. Okay, Gabriella? WCB, CGB, come on up. Uh, so, uh, Commissioner Starks mentioned the uh, average daily population of being 50 or more. That's my understanding of what the requirement is for the relay services to be available. Um, what was the logic behind keeping that 50 uh, ADP and not eliminating that requirement? Hi. There, um, we're asking further questions in the further notice on um, proposing to expand the obligations, uh, but we're looking at additional data and getting that data in the record. Okay, um, and then also, were there any other changes made from the draft in the final item? Um, we, as we always do, we respond to the record um, in the ex partes during uh, the time from circulation. So we did um, address some of the issues that were raised and either address them in the report and order or raise them as questions in the further notice because we didn't have sufficient record to, um, to deal with them in the order. Okay, moving on to our public safety item, report and order on accessibility for emergency alerts. Any questions on this? Going once? No? Okay. Then we'll move on to our last item, which is the NPRM regarding uh, analog TV rules. Any questions on that? Okay. Kept that short and sweet. I believe Commissioner Carr is here, so I'll turn the floor over to him. Thank you all so much. Uh, thanks so much. I just want to uh, obviously start with a couple of the same remarks that I made earlier with Hurricane Ian. We at the FCC have a website up, fcc.gov slash Ian. We are having teams that uh, the chairwoman has sent down to Florida monitoring, tracking, see where we can be of assistance. We obviously issue STAs, uh, can take other actions to help carriers get and stay online. So I want to thank the chair, uh, her team, the public safety officials uh, at the FCC that are working on this. And I would encourage, as I indicated earlier, um, for the mobile wireless carriers to uh, look wherever they can to roam on each other's networks where it's technically feasible. Um, I think that'd be an important step to take uh, right now, uh, not a couple days from now. So I hope that that's taking place. Uh, I just got back yesterday from a quick two-day trip to Brussels. I focused there on two main issues. One was uh, continue to look at the support that's building not just here, but now in Europe as well on the issue of having big tech companies start to contribute a fair share uh, towards efforts to bridge the digital divide. That's obviously an issue we focus at the FCC. We just did a USF report, I think, since we've last had a press conference. Um, and if you look at the report itself, it recognizes a lot of the harms <laughs> that would flow if we were to shift from assessing telephone revenues to assessing broadband revenues. Uh, and the report also recognizes a lot of the benefits of having the large technology companies that benefit from these USF outlays start to contribute. And we encouraged um, 
in my statement and to some extent in the report, Congress to take a look at this issue where we would definitely need some additional authority from Congress in order to fully implement that fair share idea. So I spoke at a couple conferences there uh, in Brussels on that topic, met with some counterparts uh, from member state uh, commissions, met with members of the European Parliament, members of the European Commission, uh, and raised this issue in all those meetings. Um, and it seems to me, my read, that there's some positive trends in that direction as well. And there's discussion there about starting uh, a consultation, which is their version of sort of the next procedural step that would be required to reach the result of a modification of EU law to require some sort of fair share. Obviously, there's a lot uh, to still play out there procedurally, uh, legal-wise, and I'm sure lobbying-wise, but I'm encouraged generally uh, by the direction and what I heard while I was there. The second issue that I was there on was TikTok. We've obviously continued to see substantial momentum building globally with concerns about TikTok. There's been several members of the European Parliament that themselves have raised concern. And so that was an issue that I focus a lot on in my meetings there. Um, also, since we last met, the Fifth Circuit decision came down on the Texas social media law. Uh, I was very encouraged by that decision and by the analysis in that decision, which I think um, produces a situation that is very much pro-speech. Um, it is going to promote a diversity of views. And I think that's a great thing. I think that's how we as a country solve our most pressing problems, is by having uh, free speech, free debate, wide open, robust discussions. So I was encouraged by that. Obviously, there's some tension in the Fifth Circuit decision with the Eleventh Circuit. So I assume people are going to be continuing the efforts to go to the Supreme Court. Uh, Florida out of the Eleventh Circuit already has done that. Uh, and we'll see if the court takes up one or both of these cases or consolidates them. But um, I think the odds are, are looking up that the court takes up one of these cases. And I think it could be one of the most significant uh, free speech decisions of the modern era when it does so. So I'm encouraged by that uh, as well. Uh, with that, happy to open up and take some of your questions. Commissioner Matt Daneman, Communications Daily. Uh, in light of the, the National Academy's report on Legato, what do you think this agency agency should be doing next? Well, look, I think the, the experts at the FCC study this issue for a very, very long time. Uh, we put our analysis out there as the expert body charged with Congress for looking at this. And there's uh, uh, nothing that I've seen that's been part of this public debate uh, that leads me to question the FCC's analysis. Of course, as the chair said, uh, we'll take a look at the National Academy report. I've personally only had the chance at this point uh, to see the highlights, so I can't uh, sort of speak too definitively about it. But I welcome the chance to do, to do a deeper dive on that report. Um, but from, from my perspective, uh, the issue has been decided, and I think I'm happy to, to move on. Hi, Commissioner. Gabriella Novello, Communications Daily. Um, as you probably saw, some RDOF winners filed comments with the FCC this week regarding LTD broadband and Starlink's um, long-form application rejections. I know you were critical of the uh, FCC's decision to reject at least Starlink's long-form application. Some of the uh, comments filed had s suggested, you know, also reject the applications for reviews that both companies filed, or at least hold the cases in abeyance so there could be more public review. I'm wondering where, uh, where you're thinking things should go, um, how you think the FCC should proceed on this. Well, in Starlink 1, I put out a, a short statement and then followed it with a, with a longer statement, uh, and that continues to, to represent my views. I mean, look, we made a decision at the FCC on the front end of the auction to set up the parameters, um, the rules that we were going to put in place for people to bid. And we made the decision, rightfully, to allow uh, low Earth orbit satellite providers to compete in the RDOF auction. By allowing that competition, um, we were able to get more commitments to get more Americans bridged across the digital divide. And at its core, uh, the Bureau's decision to reverse that uh, looks a lot more like a reversal of that FCC decision to even allow uh, a satellite provider to compete uh, than it does look like the traditional type of analysis uh, and consideration you would do at a long form stage. And that's why I sort of expressed my disagreement with it. Uh, I continue to feel that way. I'm obviously going to take a look at the record as it develops. Um, and I'm open to hearing different people's perspectives. Uh, but that's certainly my starting point. Lynn Stanton from TR Daily. Um, I was wondering uh, whether you had any thoughts on this major questions doctrine um, in the courts on, on regulatory agencies' actions. Uh, 
Representative McMorris Rogers wrote to the FCC in the last couple of days, um, sort of emphasizing that the commission needs to restrain itself within um, its constitutional limits, and uh, that issue has also been raised in the court challenges to the whole USF structure of, of assessing contributions. I was wondering what your thinking about it was. Well, generally, I'm very encouraged by the development and now maturity of the major questions doctrines. I think at its core, what it's about is making sure that agencies uh, make decisions based on, you know, express delegations that they were given uh, by Congress. And, you know, look, when it comes to the, the net neutrality debate, whenever it, it does uh, come back up here at, at the FCC, uh, we'll see how it plays out. I mean, look, the 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 digital world of, of 2022 uh, is very different than the one of 2015. And to simply, you know, offer up the same uh, solution set to harms or perceived harms in 2022 that we did in 2015 is certainly uh, a very backward looking approach. And if the idea behind net neutrality continues to be that we need to protect uh, the bits of, of data from discrimination, then I think it's important to ask, well, we're in the internet ecosystem is that discrimination taking place. I think the evidence of the last couple of years would not take you to the ISP layer. Uh, it would take you to a different layer, to edge providers, potentially cloud services providers, app stores. That's where we've seen the last couple of years discriminatory action. In many ways, when it comes to choice and competition, particularly for consumers, uh, you have far less choice when it comes to those portions of the internet stack than you do at the ISP level in many, many parts of the country. So um, we will see how that debate plays out. When it comes to net neutrality in the form of basic rules of the road, there's really long been uh, not a ton of controversy there. I think you can very easily get to a bipartisan consensus on no blocking, no throttling, and similar bright line rules. Um, the reason that it's sort of been stuck where it has been is that some people say net neutrality. Uh, but they don't mean and no blocking and no throttling. What they mean is Title II. And what they mean by Title II uh, in particular is rate regulation. But if people that want net neutrality uh, put aside uh, their aspirations for rate regulation and actually uh, express an interest in net neutrality rules, then I'm confident that there's a way that we can do this that both is based on um, where discrimination is taking place in the Internet ecosystem right now and putting some common sense rules in place. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Sanya Rao with CTFN. Can you talk to us more about your discussions with the members of parliament in Europe concerning TikTok and what the next steps would look like? Yeah. So had a lot of different meetings with several different members of the European Parliament. Also met with several members of the European Commission, uh, Margaret Vestager uh, and Roberto Viola, who are two uh, of the officials at the European Commission that I met with. I don't know procedurally what their next step would be. It could be um, there's already been one letter written to Vistager and others um, from MEPs asking questions about it. Uh, TikTok has responded to that letter. But there could be additional letters, additional inquiries. It could take that uh, type of a form. You know, here in the US, while I was in Brussels, I saw there was a New York Times report that came out um, that purported to, at least in my read, break two pieces of information. One was it was reporting that there's a, apparently a preliminary deal uh, that has been negotiated by the administration uh, with TikTok, presumably through the Treasury CFIUS process. That was news break one. Uh, news break two uh, was it reported that people close to the DOJ number two, um, as well as some Treasury officials, uh, don't believe that that deal is strong enough uh, when it comes to national security concerns in TikTok. Uh, and that's concerning to me. I, I, I think if there's one thing that we've learned with TikTok over the last two years is the degree to which they have engaged in gaslighting, um, misrepresentations regarding data flows. And I'll simply go back to the June BuzzFeed News article, which said at the very last paragraph of that story had a quote from a TikTok official that talked about this type of a deal, whether it's Project Texas or the CFIUS one, about putting government-imposed controls in place to monitor data flows. And the TikTok official, uh, said that at the end of the day, it remains to be seen if product and engineering can still get access to that information. At the end of the day, these are all tools that were built in China. So I think step one for any negotiation with TikTok needs to be for them to come clean and provide a full accounting for the data flows that have taken place since 
they've done business here in the U.S. We need to fully understand it. A couple weeks ago, there was a, a Senate hearing, and the TikTok official was asked, do you allow access by the Chinese government? They said no. They were asked, do you allow access uh, by the CCP? They said no. And then they were asked, do you allow access by members of the CCP? And they said they didn't want to get into answering that question. And I think that's both very telling and undermines the response to those first two questions. So if it appears to be the case, as their response would indicate, that right now TikTok is allowing access from inside China to sensitive U.S. user data by members of the CCP, that is accessed by the CCP, that is accessed by the Chinese government, and that is problematic. So given the lack of trust right now with TikTok uh, and their relations, I, I don't understand. Uh, again, I don't know the details of this deal. The very little that I know from uh, the New York Times report uh, suggests to me that it is going to fall far short of securing U.S. national security. And I assume one reason that the story got leaked uh, was that there are people inside the administration that hold that same type of a view. Um, if that's the case, then, then yeah, I hope this, this deal isn't finalized in its current form and we put some protections in place. And I have a hard time at this point seeing, given the misrepresentations up to now, how this lands in a way that doesn't involve some sort of divestiture or clean break, both in terms of ownership structures uh, and data flows. Because again, there's three core issues that we've been looking at with TikTok. One is the data flows back into China uh, that I think they've been misrepresenting and how that data once obtained can be used for espionage, um, blackmail, uh, and similar nefarious activities. Two, there's been concerns, I haven't spoken as much about it, but other people have, about the content coming back into the U.S. Uh, based on these algorithms and whether it could be used as part of a foreign influence campaign. There's real concerns there. But the third concern that's also been, been raised is when we look to the future, in addition, hopefully not to sort of kinetic uh, military um, disputes, uh, AI is an important weapon of the future. Uh, we don't uh, tend to sort of sanction or allow physical kinetic arms to find their way to uh, China, to Russia, to similar actors. Uh, but yet, this third concern I'm talking about is about taking this user data, even if it's been anonymized in some way, um, sort of separate from those first two concerns that I had, but we are effectively feeding the AI machine uh, that China is developing, improving it, making it better, making it more effective. So if that is the case and that's ha taking place, then these concerns go beyond, you know, TikTok as a as a um, individual application to more broadly. Why are we sending U.S. user data back uh, to educate and improve China's AI uh, if they're going to be using it for authoritarian authoritarian ends? So a short answer for you. Good. Okay. Thanks, all. Appreciate it. Commissioner, another question? Or do you yeah, oh, go for it. Cool. I'm uh, Matt Danley, Communications Daily. Um, the, the chair had indicated on the orbital debris item, the chair had indicated we reached agreement on five years, that's why five years got passed today, which seems to indicate that there's disagreement on the eighth floor on other aspects of orbital debris. Where, can you characterize where you or your colleagues stand on issues like indemnification or, or required maneuverability of satellites? Where, where are the, the schism marks or the schisms uh, uh, regarding other aspects of orbital debris on the eighth floor? I'm not sure there's, there are significant differences of opinion on that. I think, you know, we, we take what's in front of us that the chair puts forward uh, for a vote. And if we're, you know, taking a bite-sized piece of, of one set of the issues, then that's, that's fine by me to do. Um, Again, sort of separate from this issue or even sort of your question, I have over the years, uh, even when um, Ajit Pai was chair, expressed some disagreement in the sense that I think in the main orbital debris should be being run you know, by an agency with a bit deeper sort of rocket science expertise. Um, but that said, I'm, I'm encouraged by the FCC taking a look at this. We'll see where the, the proceeding goes. And I'm not, I'm not aware of any major you know, latent dispute on the floor about orbital debris right now. All right. Thanks, all. Appreciate it.